Probably most of you will know uh, precisely who my panelists are, but I'm going to introduce them anyway. Uh, on this side, let's start with Ambassador Mike McFall. He is a uh, United States former ambassador to Moscow during the Obama administration. He's director of the uh, Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. Mike, very warm welcome to you. Please do give him a, a warm welcome so he knows he is welcome. Uh, to my right, we have Olga Stefanishina. She is Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration in the Ukrainian government. Minister, it's great to see you and welcome. Uh, on my left-hand side, give a very warm welcome to Carl Bildt. Of course, you all know him. He's a long-term friend of YES and the former Foreign Minister of Sweden. And also a very warm welcome, please, to Congressman Jim Costa, Democratic congressman and a very strong longtime supporter of Ukraine. Congressman Costa, great to see you too. Uh, I want to develop our conversation. We're talking about reform and demo democracy in Ukraine. We're talking about accession to uh, NATO and the EU. Of course, vital strategic ambitions of the Kiev government. Uh, and the issues really are how Ukraine is doing in meeting the conditions for membership of both institutions and how those institutions should look at Ukraine, its current experience, and what expectations they should bring uh, to Ukraine. Uh, Minister Stefanishina, I want to start with you, and I just want to ask you a very blunt question. I've been coming to these yes conferences for a long time. I've heard many Ukrainian politicians make big promises about the speed and scale of reform, the kind of promises that are meant to reassure your partners in the EU and NATO. But the, the brutal truth is that after 2014, the gov successive Ukrainian governments did not deliver the speed or the scale of reforms that Western partners wanted to see on many different levels. Now, your country is fighting a brutal existential war. Why should your partners have any confidence that in this new, terribly difficult situation, you can deliver the reforms that you weren't able to deliver before the war? Thank you so much. It's a, it's a very good question and something, in fact, I wanted uh, to start with. First and foremost, let me share your message that I've heard a lot of promises as well. And uh, I've been uh, always a Ukrainian living here, voting for those presidents and uh, um, members of parliament uh, who have not been delivering for years as well. But um, let me start by saying that this year, just in a couple of months, we will mark the 10th anniversary of the revolution of dignity. And I would ask myself back in 10 years ago, who have been standing on uh, Maidan, uh, whether I can be satisfied with where I am right now and what all the, the friends who have been standing with me there, uh, what we have done, what you've managed to accomplish. And I can assure you that definitely I would not only be sorry for where we are, but I would be proud with everything we managed to do. And if it comes for a price, and where the price is, the, is fighting the full-scale war, losing the best ones, but keep on moving and running, this price is the one we have to pay. But we also have to understand that uh, now it's not only Ukraine, it's whole, whole Europe who should stand uh, united. Of course, we were never been perfect. Uh, and there were a lot of concerns and things to discuss. But it's really important that these 10 years were not only marked by the reform process, but also the process of self-digging and self-understanding. And here you see a Ukraine strong, Ukraine resolve, and Ukraine committed. And uh, literally, uh, being in this business of running this country closer to you and NATO, I can assure you that over the time of war, of the full-scale war, we managed to accomplish everything nearly, which has been the case 
for critics or anything else. It affected new challenges, it affected new needs, it affected new transformations, but the commitment is there. And I also want to bring to your attention a very interesting angle that before the full-scale war, everybody saw Ukraine with a brand new leader, brand new team, and a brand new political generation. And it is still there. So there are so many significant and, let's say, basic transformations which happened. We do not have, almost do not have, a old political layer which has been br bringing back the reflections from the post-Soviet time, the old school policy planning and making things, building the policy on the slogans and the electoral campaign. We have a fully new, sustainable and visionary political class born. It will be evolving if the elections will come and when they come, but it will only get better. And it's really important to understand the very last message that there will always be problems. Uh, but Ukraine now understands that we are Henry Ford. Uh, we are uh, the best leaders who have found the strength and commitment and allies to accomplish big things, knowing that they do not have the best background, and that's what we're doing. Okay, well, that, that, that's a powerful opening statement. I just, very briefly, as you've got your three overseas panelists with you, just tell me, are you bitterly disappointed that in the last few months we've seen NATO at Vilnius issue many more warm words about Ukraine, but not give you the membership action plan, not give you the specific pathway to membership that you hoped for, and are you also disappointed with the EU, which has made you a candidate for membership, but is indicating that it is still not satisfied with most of the specific criteria that you need to meet to begin formal negotiations? Are you addressing these gentlemen bitterly disappointed with what you're getting from partners? Well, this is uh, an emotion which uh, we cannot afford to ourselves. We cannot be disappointed or over disappointed or over happy with something. We really keep on running and, and, and surviving. Well, and yeah, but you can. You, you, yeah, but you, we you, can. You, you, but you we, can we had a minute. We had a minute of disappointment, but <laughs> we, we learned. Uh, we learned our lesson, and the biggest lesson uh, confirming that this Vilnius summit has a very historical. Um, uh, historical dimension is that uh, basically we understood that it's too big responsibility for leaders to take these decisions by themselves over these events and that's what we have to understand that first and foremost we need support of people populations in the countries uh, of our partners and the parliaments because sometimes these decisions were too tough there were too little uh, general public understanding and consensus and the voice of Ukraine saying that we know that only five words in the Vilnius summit declaration, not Article 5 for Ukraine, not more weapons or not something that would really change something in your countries, but only five words in the declaration of Vilnius summit could change the war. They would nearly kill Putin because we think the one way, but what Putin thinks, he thinks the other way. He is very emotional and this would nearly kill him. But we were not hurt, but that disappointed us first. But secondly, we understand that to back up leaders with the ability to make this decision, we really need to form the consensus and have the backup of the societies and the parliaments. All right, well, thank you for that. And, and I sense the disappointment, even if you're careful about voicing it. So let's t talk to our international panelists. Jim Acosta, let me start with you, uh, and particularly on the NATO issue. Do you believe NATO got it wrong at Vilnius? No, I think that uh, as we would realize, it's a challenging process. I mean, who would have thunk two years ago that Finland and Sweden would have been an, accepted as a part of, of NATO? Uh, this is, I think, uh, a degree of expectations. Vilnius, I think, uh, set a cri set of criteria. Uh, not that everybody's expectations were met. But I'm very hopeful that next year in the meeting in, in Washington, 
that uh, we'll find a much more defined path to uh, Ukraine's uh, ascension into NATO. Uh, and, and that, you think, will happen whether the war is continuing or not? Because at the moment, it almost looks like NATO wants to put off the big decisions until the fighting has stopped. Well, NATO, as you know, is, is a consensus process. So they don't, uh, you have different points of view within the leaders of NATO. But I think that uh, progress continues to be made here on the war, to your point. I think that will benefit uh, next year's uh, meetings uh, in, in Washington. And I think that there is uh, quiet progress that was made in Vilnius, and we need to build on that. All right, I want the input of my other two <coughs> international panelists. So, Carl, uh, rove across both the NATO and the EU membership challenges. Uh, uh, you're a former foreign minister, which means you're kind of freer now to say what you really think than you are, were when you were in government. Do you think that the, the partners of Ukraine in NATO and the EU are being too cautious? They are not sufficiently understanding the importance of, of the symbolism that comes with positivity and a focus too much on the detail of what Ukraine still needs to do? No. Okay, so justify. No, I don't think they are. I mean, if you look at from the EU angle, um, the process is going much, much, much faster than anyone would have anticipated a couple of years ago. Um, if you take the historical analogy, uh, X numbers of countries have entered the European Union. Average time from the application to membership has been nine years. Three and a half of those years is normally from the application to sort of getting candidate status. That was done in months. An absolute record time. Greece, after the fall of the Kurnans, was in the same category, but absolutely record time. And a couple of years ago, talking about a membership perspective for Ukraine was unthinkable. Death penalty in Brussels for anyone who even tried. And now all of the countries, member states, are on board for that. And you will see what will happen to you in the next few weeks and months. This is going to be the dominating issue on the EU agenda. We will have the uh, EU leaders on the 6th of October in Grenada. That will be the number one issue. You will have a decision in all probability in December at the European Council, and then start of an accession process. That really, really that's, that's, that's a, a very confident prediction, given that uh, yeah, commission is. officials are still talking about only two of the, the seven different chapters are no, seeing satisfactory progress. Oh, it's somewhat more. It, it, that was in the, you are somewhat behind. Am I? Curve. Am yes. I way behind the curve? Not way behind. So how many, how many of these seven different uh, key criteria do you think Ukraine has made sufficient progress to, uh, to say that the official... Most, but not all. I think we have two that are sort of up to sort of define and... I think Ukrainians need to sort of be somewhat better on the asset declaration. Um, I, I think there are questions on minorities that is difficult, both from the EU and from the Ukrainian point of view. Uh, but I think substantial progress. I, th that's why I'm fairly confident. 90%. It's yeah. not bad. And for a Swede, a cautious Swede, that's... Of course. Yeah, yeah, cautious Swede. But it has to be said, this is the beginning of a journey of pain. Uh, because uh, to negotiate accession to the European Union is a lengthy process of negotiated surrender uh, to all of the provisions and the acquis and the rules and the regulations. But in order to be fully there, to get the full benefits of access to the markets and benefits, you need to be fully part of it. Um, so it is a lengthy process of a couple of years to do it. And, and you know, when you talk about years of pain, where do you think that when you look at Ukraine and the way it is today and the systems it has in place, the governance issues, where do you think the greatest points of pain will come? Well, I think the greatest points of pain might actually come inside the European Union rather than in Ukraine, uh, strangely speaking, because it will require adjustment primarily on the financial side. Uh, cohesion funds, as it's called, that is building roads, <laughs> and those sorts of things. Uh, agricultural support, uh, this is roughly two-thirds of the EU budget. And there will have to be 
as has been the case before. Every wage of enlargement, be that Spain, Portugal, Greece, be that Poland, Central Europe, has meant a substantial reallocation of both structural and agricultural funds. Mm. That has been associated with significant political turmoil. Um, this will not be an exception. Mike, I want to bring you in. Uh, Jim was saying he's confident that there will be real movement over the next year and that by Washington, NATO 2024, decisions of He's confident decisions that will help Ukraine feel it's really got a NATO commitment uh, will be made. But isn't the truth of this, the big picture of this, that there is no way for Ukraine to become a full NATO member while there is still conflict with Putin's Russia? Isn't that just a simple truth? Well, first of all, it's great to be back. It's great to be on this panel. And I want to point out that everything that Carl just said is because, you, as a social scientist, you want to look at what's changed, right? You talked about you've been coming for many, many years. You've heard about reform, reform. It hasn't happened. Two big things have changed. One, Ukraine is at war. That focuses the attention of the government. I have lots of colleagues in the government. And two, you've never had a deputy prime minister like Olga. Uh, uh, and that is a big change. Uh, and and I... I'm not an expert on the EU, and I'm not going to talk about the EU. I'm American, so I'm not allowed to. Uh, but, <laughs> but I think the challenge is the exact opposite. They're going to go fast. They're going fast. Uh, will the EU be prepared on that part? Right. But you asked me about NATO. I did. Um, I want to say two things about NATO. Um, there was no progress at all from Bucharest to Vilnius. And we need to say that honestly. Uh, we talked about NATO aspirate. We, I was in the government, other governments did, the Trump people did, the Biden people did, NATO aspirations. But let's be honest, there was no progress, there was no interest in moving that forward. Vilnius moved it forward slightly. Vilnius was different than Bucharest. But, not enough. I believe that what needs to happen in Washington, historic summit, is the NATO at that summit Ukraine should be issued an invitation to join NATO. Yes. What, what hold on. The, what, I didn't answer on, your question what, yet. What, no, the, the I'm point is, answer, but hold on. I didn't answer will your the question small print, yet. There will be a lot of small print but, on that invitation. What will the small print say? Because invitation is not membership. Sure. And, when, and we need to understand that difference. You are right. In my view, my personal view, if if Ukraine, if the proposition is Ukraine would join NATO next summer while the war is going on, the American people are not going to support that. I'm not going to speak for other countries. Um, and I worry that that would undermine Article 5, by the way. I don't like this argument, well, they're going to be in NATO, but Article 5 doesn't really apply because they're at war. I don't like any of that. But what I do like is invitation followed by an accession process. And remember, for all countries, that's two years, sometimes three years. Sweden had an invitation. Sweden's not in, in NATO right now. There's a process. And I think symbolically saying, this train has left the station. Putin needs to feel symbolically. We, th we sometimes forget how important these symbols are. He needs to hear next summer. It's not a question of if. It's just a question of time. The invitation has been issued, and membership, formal accession, all that process, that can follow later. Here, right. here. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. The thing is, this panel is really exploring sort of flexibility and mindset, both in Kyiv on the part of the Ukrainian government and people, but also the mindset and the flexibility of Ukraine's partners in the West. I want to ask you, and whoever wants to answer this, feel free. I want to ask you what you made of one guy who indulged in some flexible thinking and then got shot down very quickly, and that is the chief of staff to Jens Stoltenberg, the, uh, the, the secretary general of NATO. When he floated this idea that given the difficulties of Ukraine and NATO with a war raging, he said, you know, we need to start maybe thinking about weaving together NATO membership with, frankly, a compromise settlement of the war. And it may be 
that Ukraine could be offered NATO membership on the basis that there will be some territorial compromise with Putin that brings the war to an end. I want to discuss that with you all, and I want you first, Olga, to address it as a representative of the Ukrainian government. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for bringing this uh, uh, this angle. Uh, in, in fact, there are some details that we will not be able even to publish in memoirs, but I shared some of them with Mike, and probably he could share, so it would not be me later. Um, but oh, uh, I, now uh, I want you to share them with yeah. all of us. I, I'm not sure I can wait for the memoirs. But, but I'll try to I'll try to be as blunt as I can. Um, in fact, uh, before we knew everybody on over Vilnius, everybody were afraid uh, and thought of two major things: whether Zelensky will show up at Vilnius per se, and what he would say afterwards. And all the leaders were trying to adjust to get to understand that everything will be smooth, that we will communicate the summit well. But things went wrong from the very beginning because we started to be aggressive if, uh, even before the flight were taken off to Vilnius. So by the moment we arrived, we heard that you should not be that emotional, you're so emotional, we are friends, we're helping you so much. But the reason for that was that we knew, as all the decisions taken in NATO by, by consensus, that one ally, and it's not United States and France, one ally thought that, whoa, we can't trade in NATO issue of Ukraine with Russia, but we can put pressure on Ukraine as well by trading the NATO issue. And then it came up to see the, the wording we, hear, we see now in the final declaration of communique, that subject to conditions are met, Ukraine will be invited to join NATO, meaning that it could be different conditions, and it's far not about reforms. So um, everything we heard from the chief of uh, political office of Stoltenberg, who is not the political person or mandated anyhow, is just the discourse he reflected. But um, you should stay calm and ready and always confident about Ukraine, that maybe your leaders cannot take this burden of historical responsibility. But our leader is backed up by all of us, but every Ukrainian. So there's no way to step back. So we see that it's a really weak discourse and it really reflects the discussions between some member states and, and, and allies. But uh, there's no a single side of uh, hesitation that uh, we only can prevail and we can only count on any prosperous or strategic planning if the historic decisions are taken. Now, Ukraine is a big country, Ukraine is a leader, and uh, uh, Ukraine is the one who have never been letting down its partners on the big things. So um, we will keep on pushing forward. Uh, we will keep on moving in that direction, but we also realistic. We're speaking about the expectations from Washington, and I hope Senator will give some of the context on that. But we should be also realistic that basically the very fact that NATO summit will take place in Washington on the 75th anniversary of the alliance is considered a huge success by 90% of the allies. So it probably only Ukraine's expectation and it's our existential expectation that there should be more. But at this point we see that something which is considered literally nothing to Ukraine could be considered by many allies as already a huge victory. Yeah. Uh, Jim Acosta, I just want to get your thoughts on what, what you felt when you read what Stoltenberg's assistant was saying and whether you feel maybe it's a bit of a taboo topic in this city right now for very understandable reasons, but whether you feel there has to be a discussion of flexibility which includes options like that. Well, thank you, Stephen. And as an aside, the, the A was dropped on Costa a long time ago, it's, but neither here nor there. Uh, I think that the way to look at Vilnius, it's a bridge, a bridge to um, uh, more work that needs to be done uh, next year uh, to 
put the conditions in the right place. Um, and I think uh, Ukraine's very aware of that. I think uh, the um, Deputy uh, uh, Prime Minister made it very clear in terms of their expectation levels. And I think uh, this is managing a lot of different challenges with the war that's going on, with the consensus process that takes place among NATO countries, uh, that in fact uh, uh, we need to make sure we get this right and that we have the consensus that's necessary. And I think when, when you look at the administration, and I don't speak for the Biden administration, but I think they've been uh, very clear about uh, uh, the importance of, of Ukraine ultimately becoming a part of NATO uh, during this difficult time. And it is a difficult time to be sure. We need to keep this coalition together. We need to keep uh, NATO strong. NATO is stronger today, I would submit, than in perhaps any time since the Cold War. Uh, Putin made a bad bet uh, when he invaded Ukraine, and now he's paying the price for that. And, and he's got 825 miles of border with Finland as a NATO uh, country. And when you look at the ramifications of that, and you look at this war that he has waged uh, and unsuccessfully against the brave, brave Ukrainian people who are standing up for democracies, uh, not only in NATO, but throughout the the, the Western world. Uh, so this is a lot of things coming together, and I believe that this is a bridge, again, a bridge till next year's efforts. And I think that uh, we've got a number of issues that have to be resolved. They're being discussed today between NATO countries as we build toward next year's summit. Okay. Well, Stephen, can I answer this question yes, a little you bluntly? Can. Go on. It was an outrageous comment, <laughs> okay? And let me tell you why so, it was well, you, You're a diplomat. You know how these no, things no, no, work. I'm not well, a why did it happen? Why did it happen? What was it telling us about what's I, going on? I want to be very clear. I was only a diplomat for two years. <laughs> uh, many people don't even think I was a diplomat when I was in Russia. <laughs> I say that proudly. When they said I didn't get along with Mr. Putin, I say proudly I did not get along with Mr. Putin. Um, I'm not a diplomat. All right. But I'll, let me tell you, but I don't want to explain why I said it, but I want to be crystal clear why it was a mistake. Number one, it would have been a mistake if Olga had said it, because here's why, if the Ukrainian had said it. Because by saying things like that, you undermine the leverage of President Zelensky when and if he has to make very difficult decisions. Absolutely. That's number one. But number two, for a foreigner to say it, mm. and, and I feel very awkward being on a panel like this talking about reform and democracy, what are you going to do as an American? Uh, I feel very <laughs> nervous about saying anything about what you should do. You should tell me what we should do about <laughs> democracy. We could use some advice. Yeah. But for foreigners to say it, it's just completely illegitimate. These, if we're going to talk about democracy, if we're going to talk about sovereignty, people are dying for these things right now in this country. We have to respect the sovereignty of the Ukrainian people and their democratically elected government. Who are we to tell them what to do about these kind of trades? It's just wrong in both counts. Right well, on, you Mike. could not have been clearer. And you know what? Even the hour I've spent on this uh, podium with, with the PM and with you guys is teaching me something which, you know, we need to, in a sense, flip around the, the debate when we're talking about y Ukraine and its relationship with NATO and the EU, because so much of the focus is on what Ukraine must do. But as you've just said, there needs to be a real focus on what the Europeans and the Americans must do. And I've got two Americans on my panel. So, guys, what the heck is going on in your country? Because there's... The, <laughs> This is a really material, important part of the debate. You know, How much it, time do you have? Well, <laughs> I had the privilege, it, yeah, it was a privilege, to talk to Nancy Pelosi and Lindsey Graham last week, right? Democrat and Republican. Well, it must have been a great week for you. Well, it was, uh, I, <laughs> I got through it, put it that way. Uh, no, it was interesting, but the point is that in, in, on Ukraine, they're both basically on the same side, but what is worrying and what is the test for the United States is that so many people in one of your two main parties are walking away from Ukraine, walking away from the sense of commitment to freedom and democracy that this war represents, and, you know, that leads to all sorts of uncertainties which play out in this country about how support can be relied upon. How much of a problem 
for you two, you two Americans, is this? <laughs> well, I think, Congressman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a challenge, to be sure. I mean, 247 years of the United States, the oldest democracy in the world, uh, through good times and difficult times. I was one of 25 members trapped in the gallery on January 6th, and I thought, my gosh, as, 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 as resilient as our democracy has been over that time period, how fragile democracy can be. And I think, you know, for the oldest democracy in the world, that is a beacon of light in most cases. Uh, it presents our own internal challenges that we're going. These are difficult times in America. Uh, we have a very divided country. That is no uh, surprise at this point in time. But we've been through these divisions before. We've been through isolationist periods before, period leading up to World War II, a, a strong isolationist movement in America. And so uh, we've got to have this discussion, this debate. We're going to have elections next year. Uh, this will be, you know, besides the economy, uh, this will be, I think, the principal uh, discussion and debate that we're going to be having <clears throat> as to what is the course that Americans' democracy needs to proceed to maintain this strong, vital uh, country that we have become. But let, let us be honest. I mean. C correct me if I, you think I'm wrong, but if Donald Trump were to win the White House next year, this whole discussion about... We are against that. What? We are against that. Well, I, <laughs> I'm a BBC guy. It's not for me to say whether I'm for it or against it, but it is for me to ask you guys whether there is any prospect on earth of the United States maintaining, uh, you know, fulsome support for Ukraine and indeed a pathway for Ukraine into NATO membership if Donald Trump's sitting in the White House. I mean, so it's not going to happen, is it? Well, I, I'm not going to predict the future, but first of all, uh, we do have a, a very vibrant, uh, healthy uh, debate in terms of how our democratic actions take place. Uh, if, uh, God forbid, uh, that uh, the previous president were elected again, and uh, that's my own view, um, I think that uh, it would be a real um, discussion in where America goes forward. I think what would happen in the House of Representatives. I think we have a very good chance to win the majority back again. Uh, the Senate, I think, is uh, up for grabs. And uh, so there's a whole lot of uh, other factors that will come into play if, in fact, uh, Mr. Trump uh, were to uh, win uh, election. But uh, there's also four uh, very <laughs> critical uh, court yeah. <laughs> decisions that this guy's dealing with. Yeah, well, let me stop you there because we're definitely going to keep our focus on Ukraine, yeah. not Donald Trump's and so legal. That's why problem. I said, how much time do you have? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we could we could discuss this in detail. But, and, and, and Carl's sitting here thinking smugly, you know what? Thank God I'm a European, not an American. But actually, <laughs> actually, again, on this notion that we need on this panel not just to be sort of testing Ukraine, but testing Europe, testing the partners of Ukraine, Europe has a profound problem too. And again, just to tap into my own experience, I've just conducted a long interview with one of the leaders of the AFD in Germany, who are now at over 20% in the polls, the second biggest party right now in the ratings in all of Germany, a far-right party who wants to make friends again with Putin, who wants Putin's gas, and who want to completely stop military support for Ukraine. And that's not just a, a, a German phenomenon. You can look around Europe and you can argue that many of the parties who are ascendant right now are deeply skeptical about continued support for Ukraine, about the notion of Ukraine in the EU or in NATO. This is a big problem, is it not, Carl? No. <laughs> um, uh, no, I think they are exaggerating. I mean, AFD, obviously. Uh, but the likelihood of AFD taking over Germany is virtually zero. Uh, if you take the other parties, also of the sort of extreme right, I mean, look at Meloni of Italy. Uh, I can take in my own country, Sweden Democrats, are solidly behind Ukraine. So there are exceptions, I agree with that. Uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman called Viktor Orban in Hungary. There's a, certainly a Viktor Orban in Hungary. And uh, we'll have an election in Slovakia. And there are a number of other issues, needless to say. But if I look at the overall the European picture, support for Ukraine has been going up, not down, during, the, during these 600 years of war. Up, not down. If I look at, and I, I've been astonished myself when I look at the opinion polls, 
that supported Finland and Sweden is solid. Might not be that surprising if you look at the map. But we support very solid in Spain and Portugal. That's really something. Or Greece, by the way, to take Greece. Orthodox country um, with the element of cultural solidarity that is there than with Russia traditionally. Fairly solid support. Uh, President Zelensky was there the other week. Um, so I, I've been surprised not only by support holding up, but support solidifying. That being said, to return to that, when we go into the entire accession process, which is a question of reforming Ukraine, but also reforming the European Union, mm. we are going to face fairly fundamental issues. This is going to be the defining thing in the European Union during the next five, six, seven, eight, ten years. Everything that is uh, going to happen. But I think there's an understanding that this is important not only for the peace and prosperity, I mean, not winning the war, winning the peace for, for, for Ukraine, but also winning the peace and stability for Europe as a whole. Because if we don't give peace and stability in this particular piece of territory in the east of Europe, we'll not have peace and stability in the rest of Europe. And, and that recognition is there. Um, it's easy if you are in a debate in Arkansas to think that Ukraine is nothing wrong with or any of the states. But if you are in Europe, this war is here. Uh, it affects us. Uh, we see the refugees, we close on television, and that is, I think, my explanation why solid support is still holding up. All right, well, it's interesting to hear that, that positive outlook. I, I, I want to bring it back now to Ukraine, and we heard Prime Minister Shmihal and we've heard uh, Minister Olga both talking about the degree to which they are absolutely confident the reform process continues, uh, everything from economic restructuring to anti-corruption, it does continue. I want to bring in two people who I know are in the audience today just to give us their thoughts and perspective on the conversation we've been having. So can I call first Anastasia Radina, who is uh, chairwoman of the committee uh, for anti-corruption policy in the RADA. So, uh, Anastasia, you've been listening very closely to this. Give us your thoughts, your perspective. I think what is important to focus on is that Ukraine is not in a situation when we approach partners making promises and asking partners to just trust our word. No, we are in a situation when we approach partners with a portfolio of what we have already done, very, very much ready to report on re the results we have already accomplished. Now, you asked me to deliver a short statement, so I will limit myself to only two examples. Four years ago, I was standing in the parliament presenting a draft law that would launch anti-corruption court in a proper way. Now I am here telling you that this one anti-corruption court puts 20 times more corrupt judges behind bars than all other courts of Ukraine uh, in all the years of independence of Ukraine. And this is a something. Now, uh, two years ago, Two years ago, as a chair of anti-corruption committee from the ruling party, I was standing in the parliament presenting the new law on anti-corruption bureau of independent selection of leadership of anti-corruption bureau. Now I am here ready to tell you that in this past two years, uh, anti-corruption institutions managed to prosecute businesses associated with two key people whom people over there on the streets would call Ukrainian oligarchs. Well, I they, would too. I I'm would, so, yeah, I would too, probably. And what, what is happening now? One of these companies is already seen their case court in, uh, heard in the court. The other one is under notification of suspicion. Now, this is the example of, uh, which gives people in Ukraine the hope to see the rule of law working. So again, we are here not only making promises, we have success stories. So we have delivered in our previous promises and Mr. Bilt, we are very much prepared to do better NASA declarations as well. Again, trust me as a head of anti-corruption committee in the parliament on behalf of ruling party. We are in a position to present our success stories as well and uh, this is what supports our uh, pledge to do more reforms and better reforms, not only because uh, uh, this is what uh, European Union expects or this is what NATO expects, but this is what people of Ukraine expect and we value value their opinion very much. Should we regard um, what has happened to Mr. Kolomoisky in, in recent weeks as very significant? What is that 
telling you and maybe should be telling us? I, I would say this. This is a person who probably counts it on his uh, capitals and his opportunities to secure him against any prosecution. And independent anti-corruption institutions of Ukraine has proven that this is not the case. This is important not only for us here, but for people over there on the streets to feel the rule of law working. Yeah. Stephen, yes. let me add a footnote. Uh, last year, um, this member of the Ukrainian parliament, uh, we had a meeting with some of her colleagues in the members' uh, dining room, and we talked about oversight and we talked about reform. And she told me then, this was about a year ago, oh, watch not what we say, but what we do. And I think her comments right now underline the fact that there is a strong reform-minded group of members of the Ukrainian parliament that are in fact serious-minded about the reforms and she's, I think, made that statement very clear by their actions. Not what they're saying, but what they're doing. Yeah, no, that, that I mean, it's interesting, interesting to hear you speak with such clarity and such confidence. I guess uh, you're a member of the Servant of the People Party. Uh, you think this commitment goes to the very top of the party? that you're not facing any obstacles from within. I think in the end, the results show that it does. Judge by result, not by the process, not by anything else, by results. And we do have this results to present, as I said. Yeah, Anastasia, thank you so much for the contribution. Carl, uh, oh, it's good because we're getting some hands up now. So we're going to turn it over to the audience for the last few minutes. But Carl, that is an incredibly important testimony, isn't it? This is what really matters. It is the deeds. It is actually to judge the Ukrainian parliament, lawmakers, government by what they do. And there's a lot. Uh, first, it should be said that a lot has been done. Uh, there's a lot of reforms that has been done in this country since 2014, as a matter of fact. Uh, and we should give that uh, due credit. I, I saw former Prime Minister Arsenyuk uh, here yesterday. It was qu under difficult circumstances quite a lot that was done during those particular years. And there were things that were very important, say land reforms, before the war. That was not entirely easy either. And um, we should not forget either that um, going back to Maidan in 2014, that was about the DCFTA, which is nearly forgotten. The Deep and for Comprehensive I, Free I remember, Trade yeah. Agreement. Yeah. That is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of commitments that Ukraine hasn't done all of it, but has done a substantial part of it. That means by doing the DCFTA implementation, boring as it is, it covers a very substantial part of the EU accession negotiations. I mean, things like fiscal sanitary provisions. This is, I was in charge of my own country's accession to the European Union, so I can testify how tedious and boring this is. But it is extremely important. And a lot of that has actually already been done. So by implementing the DCFTA by doing the reforms that have been done successively since 2014, quite a lot has already been done. That is not saying that it will not be a difficult journey. Oh, you've told uh, us about the, the pain ahead. So Stephen, we, yeah, you yeah. may comment shortly on. on that. Yep. So um, it's, uh, it's about saying what, what we do. Uh, and um, we always underestimate, we hear like, either on these gatherings or believe me, it's my freaking daily job to hear how we under delivering. And I will be the last person in this country to hear that you did something good or right, uh, the best way. Even if Ukraine gets the candidate statues, Ukraine joins NATO, Ukraine opens the accession talks or become member of EU. We, will, uh, we were laughing yesterday, even all of these happenings, the political slogans of our leaders of opinions would sound the same, as if nothing has been happening. But I want to, to give a message in the spirit of my prime minister, his, who is always talking uh, in a numbers way. So uh, we have the DCFTA, right, uh, as Carl was referring. It has uh, around 300 plus pieces of regulations which should make the trade go fine. And we heard 
for nearly a decade, that you're under-delivering on that, things are not done here, things have not been going there, but we're preparing now for the accession talks. We have to do the self-screening, and whoa, what we found out, that we not only implemented 300, we implemented 1,200. But unfortunately, 1,000 of them is not in the association agreement, so Ukraine is not delivering. But Ukraine is top 20 importers to EU. Ukraine is part of the customs procedure. Ukraine is part of the energy market. Ukraine is the largest food supplier. Ukraine is the security guarantor. But oh my god, we have not implemented something according to the association agreement. So really, we should always have this angle. And for us, in fact, the decision on candidate statutes have opened eyes on ourselves because we also now responsible for other countries, for the other countries of Western Balkans who now orient to us. And this is a huge shift comparing to the years ago. And we hear from the leaders, from the president and prime minister and members of the government of Moldova, that they are so proud of our accomplishments, which are helping them so much. And they know that probably they do not deliver about everything, but they know that we do. So, so we feel a bigger responsibility, we have much more commitment as ever before, but we really need always saying that we are not good somewhere. It is always happening. We really have this bigger picture in our head. No, that, that, that's fascinating, and I thank you for that, Olga. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm gonna open this up just in the last few minutes to a free-for-all, so get your hands ready to put them in the air and ask a question of our panel. But just before we do that, one other contributor I'd like to uh, invite just to give us a, a thought or a question, and that is Stanislav Aseyev, who is a longtime democracy activist in this country. Stanislav, uh, you've been listening, I know, so give us your brief comment, if you would. I will speak in Ukrainian, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, so everybody get your headsets ready. Well, I know I am deeply confident that the fact that Ukraine is still not in NATO is not a result of some formal under-delivery by Ukraine, but uh, the result of a total misunderstanding of uh, the West of what Russia is all about. If it wasn't for the Ukrainian military who uh, secured Kiev in, in the first several uh, days of large-scale uh, invasion, probably uh, if it wasn't for our military, we would now be thinking, why the heck did we wait for so long helping Ukraine? And we would not be able even to talk about accession to NATO or the EU. I am a co-founder of Justive Initiative uh, uh, Foundation, and uh, we are looking for war criminals of Russia. Um, a year ago, I ha had a meeting with uh, um, senators of the U.S., and I told them that you have huge Russian assets. Give at least part of them to support our activities, because looking for Russian war criminals using Russian money for that would be uh, fair and square. And they said, sorry, this will never happen. This is a war uh, against Putin. We are fighting against Putin. What does it have to do with the Russian people? Well, if you phrase it that way, then the four billion dollars that the prime minister uh, spoke about would have to be uh, paid by the European and American taxpayers instead of uh, uh, ordinary Russians who will say that we have nothing to do uh, with that. And this is a total misunderstanding of what, what it's all about. Likewise, when we talk about NATO, a lot of people in the West think that they can uh, uh, take a template and apply it to Ukraine and see what we've achieved and what we've failed to achieve. This is not the right way to go about it, because this can be a right about countries which uh, do not border uh, on uh, Russia, but in Russia, 
you, now you have a fascist regime and you cannot buy it up, you, 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 you can only defeat it, that's it. And your failure to understand this is a sign of weakness. I just want to follow up on, on that and your uh, focus on, on Russia with Mike, just very briefly, Mike, because I do want to get a few questions in. But you, you've written quite extensively about the... The fear of escalation in Washington, uh, and this conversation is not supposed to be about the battlefield and how the war is going and what weapons are supplied and all of that, but, but this fear of escalation, does it play into an American uh, sort of caution about contemplating Ukraine's NATO future because it would once and for all sort of reignite a long-term era of hostility between Washington and Moscow? I is there some residual fear there, which is playing into the, the way this is being handled? Yes, so analytically, yes. Um, when Mr. Putin and his other folks around him uh, talk about nuclear weapons, they are achieving a very strategic purpose in that. It's, it's very rational. If I were working for Putin, I would say, talk about nuclear weapons, because that makes us nervous about sending attack arms. It makes us nervous about extending an invitation at the 75th summit. So it is very much there and people need to understand that. I think it's wrong, my, my personal view, is that we're constantly overestimating escalation. We're constantly worried about that. We have bought into Putin's propaganda about how he needs to save face, he needs off ramps, uh, he's a tough guy, the rat in the corner, and, when, and therefore we have to accommodate him. If you look historically, when push comes to shove, that's not actually how he behaves. But, but the answer is yes. But the second thing I want to say, because I'm looking at the clock, I'm guessing I'm not going to be able to speak again. Um, we, for many decades, we, I'll just speak for my country, but maybe it's true for other countries as well. We've had this idea, we're the West, we're the United States, we're the hegemon, we are providing you, Ukraine, with ideas about democracy, that was before. Now we're providing you with security. We're providing you this, that, and the other, and oh, you know, this is what you need to do, just like you say, because we are being so generous with you. I want to challenge that framework for the future. Right now, Ukraine is a net importer of security. That is true, they're fighting a war. In the future, Ukraine will be a net exporter of security for Europe, and I think for the world. They will have the most powerful army in the world. They will have, in, in Europe, and, and one of the most powerful armies in the world. They will have the military industrial base that will be a player that will provide security for our NATO allies. So we've got to get out of this idea that we are giving you these things. This is in our national interest. One more example. We haven't talked about sanctions, but you heard President Zelensky talk about it yesterday, the speed stuff. He's like, you guys are always talking about speed. What about, oh, there he is right there, talking about it right there. Look at him. He's talking at us right now. And, 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 and we think, oh, well, you don't understand our process and blah, blah, you know, all these reasons why we have to have incremental progress. I want to reverse that. Our technology right now is being used in Russia to make rockets that then come to this country and we spend way more money to shoot down those rockets. Thousands of dollars for these stupid little components, they're not stupid, that for these small components that we then spend millions of dollars to shoot down. That is irrational. So it's not just goodwill. It is in our own national interest to make all these things happen, to make Ukraine stronger. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I've been a bad chairman because we're running out of time and I did promise some questions. I'm, you promised me you're going to give a very brief question. You've got to be really brief. Very brief. Um, I support you all with the reform process and what has been done. I have a lot uh, to, uh, to accept when, when there is a war ongoing. You cannot have it all in this uh, uh, crystal clear form, but you will return to the reform path after the war is over. And and have all our support, but my question is, and that is the, I think, are you aware that one could spoil all the good uh, developments when you do the wrong thing and, for instance, have an election during a war? I would strongly 
recommend not to think further about that. You do not have, during the war, a government of national unity with other countries in war have had. So then that would be on an equal footing. But you are in a situation, I think, where you should definitely not think of uh, giving this wrong impression. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, that, Olga, you, you respond to that. I, I did ask uh, the I'll PM about short. it, but yeah. Two things just to make this clear, Mark. I'm really sorry. What do you say saying that we will come back to the path of reforms after the war? You know the best. I meet you every time in Brussels. I spend my breakfast time meeting and talking to you <laughs> about everything we do. So please, it's really, it's really, it's it's really not good to hear that. Uh, secondly, uh, about the elections. So this this discourse is not evolving from from us. You will not hear it from me or from President. We are answering the questions, and basically, this is the sign of of democracy. We are getting uh, getting tired, and it's really a huge challenge challenge to keep the country running and you know that you can operate and you can do 10 times more before you could have done before the beginning of the full-scale war but uh, at the same time you understand that you live in not normality you live in war and there are many things you can do uh, so uh, this is normal in Ukraine to have any discussions and believe me if we, there would be elections in Ukraine in time of war this would be the most democratic elections in the world first and second, this will be all European elections because all Europe will be organizing this election. So this uh, is positive things. But the second thing is that it's not like somebody's thinking or planning elections a part of other political groups who are really need more, let's say, energy uh, and, uh, uh, and power. But it's just the discourse and it's normal for Ukraine, absolutely. And it doesn't mean that there's somebody who's working on that target lane. All right. Well, Stephen. Yes. Could, could I have a final word? You, you are going to get the final word because this has to be the final word. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, the uh, sponsors and Victor for all of us coming together here in the middle of this war in, in uh, Kiev uh, because it is critical. As we see there, the future is being decided in Ukraine. And I think the comments that, that Mike made as it res relates to our country in the United States, I mean, this is about good and evil, but, but for America, it really is about our own self-interest. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is, is what we've learned through the brave gallant efforts of the Ukrainian people is that uh, the, the corruption in, in, in Russia, uh, his army is just as corrupt as the country is itself. It's a Potemkin village. And, and this is where we draw the line for democracies around the world and for the United States. We, we either stand together, as I said last year, this is the test of our time. And historians will judge in the next five or 10 years whether or not we met the test of our time here in Ukraine. And that's why the future is being decided here and why our actions together uh, with NATO, with the European Union, with uh, the uh, Western democratic nations is so critical that our resolve remain firm as we, we, we continue to support Ukraine to the very best of our ability. Right, well, thank you very much, Congressman. I think, uh, I think what we've taken from this panel is that you know, we are learning an awful lot about the extraordinary resilience and determination of Ukraine through this war and everything that it brings with it, but we're also learning a lot about the United States, the EU, and those partners of Ukraine who are having to do some very deep thinking of their own. 